said, where are my men at? Let's worship him in this place. Lord God, we ask that you rest on us. You know, there's this scripture, when Jesus was baptized, it said the Holy Spirit just came like a dove and just rested on him. The peace, the presence, the Spirit of God, and the ramifications of that changed everything for him for his disciples for fathers and for all humanity to this day that spirit of God and we're going to talk a little bit about that today amen amen you may be seated it is great to be in the house of the Lord this morning man happy father's day to all the fathers, to all the spiritual fathers and uncles and big brothers and to the women that have played incredible roles in the lives of children. I mean, just we celebrate the spirit of fatherhood because God is a good, good father. And we're going to talk about that today. But I have a few things I just want to hit up real quick before we get into it. One is, if you are here for the first time, if you are in the church for the first time, or if you're online for the first time, we want to welcome you. Thank you for coming on in or tuning in this morning. We want to properly welcome you. If you're in the building, we want to meet you afterwards right outside at our guest center. If you're online or in the room, we want you to do the same thing, which is text the word guest to the number on the screen. Text the word guest to the number on the screen because we want to connect. We want to meet you. We want you to be able to meet us. We want you to know that this is not just a church you come on Sundays. It's a place where you belong. It's a place we call home. It's a place we call family and friends. And we do life together in a way that's not creepy and weird, but a way that's real and down to earth. So we would love to meet you, like I said, afterwards at the guest center or online, text that, and we will connect with you. Amen? Amen. Also, it is with a somewhat of a heavy heart, but a true celebration as we celebrate one of our brothers that went to be with the Lord yesterday. And uh, many of you may know him by sight. His name is August Augie Bibon. He cleans for 20 plus years. You saw him every single week on Saturdays during the week, cleaning this house, cleaning the uh, offices. Man, a servant of God who went to be in paradise yesterday. So we send our condolences to his family, but we celebrate him today for being such a great steward and father and a model in this house for so many, so many years. Amen. Amen. Let's get into the word this morning. So today is Father's Day, and it's not a coincidence that it is one of the least favorite, the least popular holidays in the United States, and that's heartbreaking. I know today, many of you that hear my voice have a hard time with Father's Day to celebrate it because of our situations, whether it's not having a dad, losing a dad, you know, whatever the case may be, hard things that we've gone through with Father's Day, and it's understandable, you know. But we also, at the same time, want to celebrate fathers, those that made the choice to not just be a natural dad, but chose to be a father chose those things. And the thing here is, and we're going to talk about this, is God is a good, good father to all of us. And it is not cliche. It is not belittling 
when we say God is our Father. Jesus told us when we pray, pray like this, our Father. Not our Master, not our Lord, not even our Savior, not, you know, our ruler, not our king, even though he's all of those things. He said, pray our Father. And it's no coincidence that it is the institution of fatherhood that the enemy specifically attacks attacks and attacks over and over again around this world throughout centuries since the beginning. And we're going to unpack some of this stuff, but I have such an encouraging word for all of us this morning, whether we're a father, whether we have a father, don't have a father, whether we're a single person, whether we're a woman, it doesn't matter who we are because this word of who God is, I think, comes to all of us. And today's title is going to be Belong, Loved, and Praised. Belong, Loved, and Praised. Turn your, your Bibles, open up your devices to Mark chapter 1, right in the beginning of Mark. We have a story of John the Baptist. He's baptizing people. And here Jesus comes onto the scene, and Jesus gets baptized by the John the Baptist, right? And in verse 10, it says, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Oh, let's just stop right there. See, because I love a vivid imagination. I love to put a word picture and try to just put life to the words, which are alive, which says, just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn apart. What does that imagery look like in your mind? Heaven being torn apart. Is that like a little zipper like, here you go. Or a door being open. Curtains. You know, just cloth. You've seen the movies. All of us have seen the movies of Jesus' baptism, right? And, the, and it's always like just these clouds and a ray of sun comes down and a pretty little bird comes down. Like, oh, so special. But the scripture said, the heavens were torn apart. I get more of an image of Loki, right, with the tesseract, putting it in to the reactor on top of the Stark building. If you've never seen Avengers, you're like, what are you talking about? But this is what I'm talking about, right? This villain, right, which we all love. You know you love Loki, okay? So... Puts it in there and just this beam just shoots up to heaven and just violently opens up heaven. Everybody in Midtown New York looks up. They're like, oh my gosh, what's happening? And then what happens with this tearing apart of the heavens that opens up to another portal, a heaven, this, right? These monsters come out. Because now it was about a new kingdom trying to take over the earth. And what was ushered in is these ugly monsters just coming on in. The Chaturi, I think I'm mispronouncing it. I don't remember exactly. Chaturi, is that it? Leslie, you know. Chatari? Chatari, there you go. Thank you. Right? So then they just come on in. But that's not the image we get of the scripture here. We get this image that violently the heavens open. And to contrast, this, it says, the Holy Spirit took a form of a dove and just came in. 
It shows immediately before Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospel of Mark. Before we see, because in the Gospel of Mark, there's not the story of the birth of Jesus. That's in Matthew and that's in Luke. In Mark, the first is Jesus going into the waters. And as he comes into the waters, it shows what heaven goes through a war to now bring peace, to now bring the Spirit of God. And it rests on him. And when it rests on him, listen to this in verse 11. The Spirit descending on him like a dove. So here now, a voice came from heaven. And God says three things that changes humanity. You are my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. God declares for everybody to hear. This account happens in three of the parallel gospels. Two of them speaks directly to Jesus. The other one says, this is my son. But here in Mark, God is talking directly to Jesus and is talking to us. He's telling Jesus You are my son. I hear my son right now saying, Daddy. What's up, Rome? That's my son. If you've been here for a minute, you've heard me claim my sons over and over and over again. Claiming, that's my son. Those are my sons. That automatically implies, if I'm to claim my son, what does it imply? That I'm what? I'm their father. So God declares, this isn't the savior. People, here comes the Messiah, but I'm not declaring him to you as the savior. I'm not declaring him to you as the king or the prince or the ruler or the Lord. Even though he is all of those things, I am declaring to you, my son, because I am a father. God wants us to know he is a father. Above all else, he's a father. And not just to him, but to all of us as we learn, as we read through the scriptures. And here's the thing. All we really need to know about our relationship with God and our relationship with each other is summed up in this declaration. God affirms his son and all of us by saying These three simple things. I claim you, I love you, and I'm proud of you. That's what God claims over his son. He says, I claim you. You are mine. You are not forgotten. You are not lost. You are not a stepchild. You are not from a single parent home with no dad. Because Jesus in the natural was all of those things. He grew up like with the kids in the neighborhood like, yo, that's not your dad, man. That's not. And then when he lost Joseph early, he came. He identifies with us. And God says, you are mine. And he tells us today, he says, I claim you as mine. You are my sons. You are my daughters. Will we receive that? Will we receive the truth that God is a loving father that loves us? 
And that's proud of us. And what I love about this, when he says he is pleased with Jesus, this starts before Jesus even starts his ministry. This is before we know of any accomplishments of Jesus. You know what we know about Jesus before this? Like one thing at the temple as a young boy. Other than that, we know nothing about Jesus. But God says, because it's not about what you do. And I think he wants us to realize that today. I'm not pleased or proud of you because of what you do. What does the Bible say? Without faith, it's impossible to what? It's a question of faith. You want to know how my son pleased me this morning? You've heard before that if, you, if you've you know, been here for a minute, my son loves his mama. And when I hear the mama's boy, you know, if, if he wakes up in the middle of the night, which he does almost every night, and he's fussing a little bit, and I always told, walk into that room, he will cry harder. <laughs> and it's heartbreaking. <laughs> like, man. So every morning he wakes up. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, I'm going to go get him. Lord, they okay. So I go get him, I open the door. He sees, yeah, oh, mommy. Now I can just open the door and get out of the way as he just runs out and runs to go see his mom. So today I was downstairs early in the morning and uh, I hear him and his mom coming down the stairs. And I'm like, that's different. Every Sunday that I'm downstairs studying, getting ready, he never comes downstairs. But this morning, he came downstairs. I'm like, Lord, is everything okay? Like, yeah. And he just gave me a big hug and said, happy Father's Day. Oh, listen, even if we go back to the normal routine tomorrow, <laughs> this, it will, it will be enough until, you know, puberty when he's going to be all about daddy. And like, I'm not talking to mommy. And I'm like, yeah. Okay. So this will get me, you know, for the next 11 years, this moment. And what happened was it was incredible because I was studying the scripture and I feel like God showed me how he's pleased with us because in that moment, I was so pleased. And it wasn't because of what he does or the works he can do or because he acted right or he cleaned his room or any of those things because he has a faith and believed in me, his daddy, and acknowledged me. And that's it. God wants us to know he claims you. He calls you his own. No matter your background, no matter what your natural lineage looks like. He loves you. And that love is powerful. We're going to break down these three things. And he doesn't just love you, but he's pleased with you. And no matter who we are, and I'll skip to the end, to the crescendo of this message, if we now, as an imitator of God, if we now can follow in the footsteps of God and if we can get people to belong, to be loved, and to be praised, the things of this world that the enemy tries to do be broken. Because if we look, if you study, you know, sociology, if you study the, the cause and effect of patterns of this world and of societies and of people and just see all of this going on, you'll see at the heart of it the lack of 
When you say the lack of fathers, it's the lack of identity. It's the lack of belonging. When you see the lack of love, you see pain and hurt and abuse. And when you see the lack of praise and being proud, you see shame and guilt and hatred and ugliness. It leads to all different types of stuff in this world that we can so easily get stuck into or we've been part of, but it can be broken. So let's, let's continue to talk here today. So God says, I claim you, I love you, and I'm proud of you. It's that simple. It's that basic. To belong, to be loved, and to be praised. To belong, to be loved, and to be praised. Let's talk about to belong. Because when I know my father and I know I'm his son, I know my identity. I know who I am. I cannot be tempted with a sense of a false identity or with a lie of the enemy or of this world. It's amazing that Jesus needed to hear these words. Does God speak anything that's senseless, that is meaningless? The Son of God, perfect, without sin, still needed to hear that he belongs, that he is loved, and that he is praised. Why did he need to hear that in the beginning of his ministry? In the, what's the next thing that happens to Jesus right after this moment? The Spirit leads him into temptation, into the wilderness to be tempted and in that temptation, he will be tempted about what is your real identity? Who does God really say you are? Where do you really belong? Are you really loved? Does he really love you? Are you sure about that? Oh, you think that's praise. Let me heap praise and praise. A, let me tell you how proud I am of you. Man, I'll make you king of all the kingdoms of this world. I'll give you... And it's a counterfeit identity. It's a counterfeit belonging. It's a lie from the pit of hell that the enemy tries to come after him. And that's the enemy's ploy, even after us today. What does the enemy go after? First, let's break you from the understanding of that you have a father and that you are loved, that you belong that you have an identity, that you are called and created with a purpose, that it isn't something you have to go out and discover or find. It isn't like, hey, do I like Indian food? I really never had it growing up. Let me try this. Oh, I really do like, no, no. Our identity is our identity. We're not tasting, I really don't like that. Let me try something else. Oh, I do like this. No, no, okay, I like this identity. No, no, I don't kind of like that one. This one's more popular this day. This is what my friends are doing. Let me now do that. No. It was amazing. Me growing up as a, as a teenager on the east side of Bridgeport in the 80s. Many of you may, may know, but there was gangs throughout all of Bridgeport especially back in the 80s. I'm not sure about today. I'm sure, listen, wherever there's a lack of fathers, a lack of belonging, a lack of identity, gangs will thrive and other things will thrive. The counterfeit will thrive. So there was the Latin kings on the east side of, throughout Bridgeport, but on the east side of Bridgeport, the Latin kings. I remember my friends wanting me to join the Latin kings. I remember like, yo, I'm Italian. <laughs> it's like, yo, man, it don't matter, come on. And I'm like, no. Because I would dip my toe. Some of the things they did was a little fun. Like, let me, okay. But when it came to like, no, no, we want you. Like, no, I know who I am. I know the voice of my father. And not at that time the voice of God. I knew the voice of my, my natural dad, who was a God-fearing man. I was blessed and fortunate, you know. But I remember just 
who I was called to be, and I knew that wasn't me. See, God wants you to know that you are his son and his daughter, so that when you go into your calling life, there's no way around it because to face your calling, to face your identity, to face the purpose you have is to face temptation, to face hardships, to face attacks. Those things will come. And if we don't know who we are, when I don't know if I'm doubt who I am in Christ, then did God really say? Did God really say? And Jesus is like, did God really say? Yes, he said. This is who you are. And Jesus said, this is who I am. Get that away from me. It's amazing. A lot of you were not able to be tempted with things that your friends were tempted growing up or even today because in you, you knew that cigarettes, I ain't smoking no cigarettes. You stink, your teeth are yellow, you're coughing all the time. I mean, your shirts, man, you need to wash those things. Like, bring a change of clothes when you come to my house, you know? I'm not trying to hate on those of you that smoke, okay? I smoked for a while, okay? It was a vice, you know, but you can get out of it, okay? Unless you really, really want to stay in it, then I don't know why, but, you know, God still loves you, okay? But my point being, I'm not throwing shame, is that someone like, you can't tempt me. You can't tempt me with these things. The true temptation comes not with the vices. The vices are the traps that we fall into when we don't know who we are, when we don't know who calls us by name, when we don't know where we belong, when we don't know our identity, when we know we have a father. See, Jesus said, man, I do everything my father does. I say everything my father says. Everything I saw my father do, I do. Jesus knew who his father was. He spent time with his father. Especially in that culture, whatever your father did is what you were going to do. It was part of your identity, your lineage, your legacy. There was no separating of it. It wasn't today. Like back then, they didn't go to college and be like, okay, here's a job fair. What do you, you know, what major do you want, you know? And we just, I don't know. Let me spend 50000 and not do this four years from now. Okay, I'm throwing shade. Let's go. Okay. And that 50000 was just for one year. Okay. All right. So, so to belong, each of us has a desperate need to belong to someone. If that need is met, we have the strength of self-identity. We know who we are, and no one can take that identity from us. Plain and simple. But if our need to belong is not met, we wander as lost and unclaimed souls. Here's something I found fascinating. Psychiatrists found out that the root of emotional disturbance is alienation, which is to be cut off from human identity and belong to no one. Isn't that what the pandemic was all about? To cut us off who we are, what we are, to not know, to alienate us. It's the greatest emotional disturbance, which then brings in a whole bunch of bad choices or meditating on bad thoughts that spiral us into a lifestyle that is opposite, that is foreign to what God has called us to. God sends a message to his son and to the world, right? He says, this is my son whom is loved, and he sends that to Jesus, but to us, he's like, yo, this is my son, and don't forget it. And what I love about that is it's the principle, it's the adoptive principle, okay, because God chose, even though 
There was the natural fatherhood. A lot of us know, unfortunately, natural fatherhood doesn't mean we have fathers. Doesn't mean we belong and we know our identity because our natural fathers can choose not to be our fathers. The adoptive principle Jesus experiences here that, yes, this is my son, but I choose him. And by doing so, extends it to all of us. If God chose Jesus, God chooses us. Here, let me make sense of this. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman and born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, you, God has made you also his heir. We are heirs. That means we have an inheritance. We are now sons and daughters brought through this adoption. What is an adoption? There are many fathers and mothers in this house and watching online that have adopted sons and daughters. And why? What they chose. And if you talk to them, like, yeah. This might be my son of birth, and this is my son from adoption, but I chose both of them. And me, they're both the same. Now they're both heirs. They're both heirs. They both get all my love. What is mine is both of theirs. There is no difference. That's how God treats us. That even though because of sin, Because we chose to walk away, even though he's a good father. And he loves us. And he loves us. We belong because we are all sons chosen by God. So now let's go to the second part. To be loved. God said to his son, right? I love you. Imagine that. God had to esteem his own son, Jesus. Told you, Jesus, I love you, Jesus. Come, I love you. And he gently, that dove, that spirit, God's spirit, just fell on him. I see in that moment, God just wrapping his arms around Jesus and saying, I love you. I'm with you. You belong to me. I'm so pleased who you are. And I'll be with you as you now walk out to the life and the calling I have for you. So, first, love gives us a sense of security. To belong gives us a sense of identity. To belong gives us a sense of identity. But to be loved gives us a sense of security. It's amazing, right? When our child cries, when they're hurt, when they're in pain, and they run into your arms, what do they want? Do they want a lecture? Do they want you to tell them exactly how they fell and how not to fall again? Or they just need that security of just us holding them, knowing they are loved right where they're at, regardless of what they've done. They are loved. Second, because time is fleeting, love is self-sacrificing. See, to be loved by God 
we get a sense of security. And if we're going to love those, because love the Lord your God with all your heart and then love others. So if we're going to love others now with this love of God and this understanding of who we are in him and how he loves us, and we're now to love others, we now fall in line that now love is self-sacrificing. In John 15, after he says, abide in me and I would abide in you, right? Jesus says this in John 15. In verse 13, what does he say? Greater love has no one than this. Then he laid down his life for his friends. God says the greatest expression of this love that I have for you is to lay down your life. Listen. Listen. How many parents right in this room, if you had to make that incredible choice, you or your child, and your child could be a knucklehead, your child could be a prodigal, you'd be like, okay, I'm going to lay down my life. And God says, this redemptive quality of love, this capacity of love that you now are going to be able to breathe in and to have fill you is that you can now not just love the son you chose, but you can love your friends and the people around you in such a way because this is what love is. And that's why we have and we celebrate today not just natural fathers, but spiritual fathers because we realize the power of spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, of mentors, of people that give themselves for others over and over and over again in the house, in the church, in our communities. All right, let me keep on going. Third, love is unchangeable. It's unchangeable. Love will always get severely tested in human relationships. But when God affirms Jesus with the words, I love you, he sets him free to be himself. When he says, I love you, with this unchangeable love, he says, it's okay. You can be who I've called you to be. Now, the risk of this is obvious. When we love so much and it's unchangeable that even if they decided to be a prodigal, the love doesn't change. So God loves Jesus so much, believe it or not, there was still the capacity, because of that love, there was still the capacity of Jesus to not fully walk out his calling. That's why in the, in the garden he said, God, is there any way, any way for, for this cup to pass me? Is there any way? But the son had to love back. Fourth is, and this is the hardest one for us, and I could write a whole list, but four things of this love that really hit me today is love is the controlled guidance system of God. Love is the controlled guidance system of God. See, whenever we hear the word control, uh, oh, here it comes. The church wants to control us. God wants to control us. Love is a controlling force, whether you realize it or not. Because I love my wife, because I love my wife, it is now the guiding controlling system in my mind, in my heart, to never, never think about looking at another woman. That's it. Oh, my wife, well, she'll get violent. <laughs> okay? She has threatened me. And she didn't threaten me because I gave her cause. Okay? She just let it from the beginning. I'm just letting you know. I will take your manhood from you. Ooh, okay, baby. 
All right. Love is the controlling, guiding system in our lives. Hey, let me give you a scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.14. For Christ's love compels us because we are conceived that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Oh, Christ loved us so much, he died for us, that now we live for him. A controlling guidance system. Compel, that word, the life, Christ compels us. That's such like, oh yeah, I'm compelled. Do you know what compel means? It means to drive or urge forcefully or irresistibly. To drive forcibly. Oh no, you're going to do this. Love is a compelling force. I love my wife so much, it compels me. That love, even if I was, it's like, are you out your mind? And pulls me right back into reality, right back to the truth of who I am, what my identity is, who God has called me to be. So much more to say. There is no greater control over our lives than the control of love. When God tells his son, I love you, he puts his self-sacrificing, unchangeable, inseparable, and controlling love on the line. Jesus has the security of a love that is willing to take a risk as well as a family identity that cannot be broken. So now... He can walk into the wilderness. He can walk into temptation. He can face the enemy. He can face the things of this world. And this love of the Father now guides him and now sets everything within him at the right temperature, at the right places, so I don't lose my mind, so I don't lose my identity, so I don't act out of anger so I don't lash out at my kid so I don't do these things because love is a controlling force love is a controlling force and then the final thing is says God says I am proud of you he praises us pleased with us. That is probably the hardest thing for us to receive and for us to give. If we cross the hurdle of knowing God is our Father and knowing where our identity is, and then if we go over that next hurdle and we truly Receive the love of the Father and then love others. This pleasing thing trips us up because it can almost get us stuck into this thing of works. That if I can do a bunch of stuff, then I can get the love of my dad or the love of my spouse or the love of my pastor. Then they'll be pleased with me if I do a bunch of stuff. And it's like, no. It's not about your hands. It's about your heart. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. This is just one scripture I pulled that says how we, God is praised, God praises us, believe it or not, and then he wants us to praise others. What do you think encouragement is? It's a form of praise, 
Ephesians 4.29 right here says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others. Isn't it amazing how this world throws that scripture out and says, no, we're going to say it how it is. We're going to be real. We're going to say the truth. Really? We're going to tear each other down because that's who they really are. No, no, no. See, you got to throw that lie off, young people. God, when he says who you really are, it's who he created you to be. It's who he knows you are. Your potential in his eyes is who you are, regardless if you ever meet that potential. That's why the Bible says, man, we shouldn't judge. Because what we see is the natural. We react to the natural. And then we speak and tear down because of the natural, of what the circumstances of us are around. But faith is what pleases God. Speaking what isn't. Believing in the promises and the word of God over ourselves and over each other. And this is the heart of the Father. And this is the heart of who he's calling us to be. Let me share one last quote with you. Dr. David L. McKenna says, when God says to his son, I am proud of you, he commends his character, honors his achievements, and encourages him for the future. If we can only learn the same truth, our family, our friends, and our colleagues grow faster in the direction of our praise than in the path of our criticism. Oh, that's so good. Here, I'm going to say it again. Write this down, okay? Our family, our friends, and our colleagues grow faster in the direction of our praise than in the path of our criticism. If only we can learn to give and receive a simple thank you. We too will release in others the confidence that God releases in his own son. If we could only speak the praise and the encouragement of others, speak into even the future, not just the natural and what they're doing today, because criticism alone, without that, doesn't build up what God has called us to be. And God is calling us to be fathers, calling all of us to have the heart of a father that will choose, choose people, that will choose to have them belong with us, to belong in our homes, belong in our communities, belong in our church, to love them, a powerful love that releases and breaks the chains, a powerful love that welcomes home the prodigal, the powerful love that sets the controls, that means even brings in self-discipline to us or disciplines us. That's why things like covering and accountability are so powerful. Don't even have time to go into that stuff. But then we'll speak life, we'll speak praise, we'll speak blessing over one another. This is the heart of God. This is the heart of a father. This is the heart of what he's calling us to be, regardless if we're a natural father or a spiritual father, regardless if we're a teenager or an adult, regardless if we're male or female. If we'll take these three things and chase after them, develop them, and have them be part of us, God will transform everything around us. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Let's pray. Thank you online. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you esteemed your son that you publicly acknowledged your son, that you chose him 
to be your son. And you loved him no matter what. And you loved him through all things, through all seasons. And that you were pleased with him on his character, on his faith, on the what he spoke and how his heart was transformed and walked out into his future. We thank you, Lord God, that you do the same for us and that we follow in your footsteps as heirs of your kingdom and do it towards others. In Jesus' precious name, everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you at home. Peace out. Those in here, stay seated. We're going to have fun right now. That you enjoyed Real our quick. presentation. Would you consider partnering with us to share the hope of God and the love of Jesus by giving? You can give your gift at klcc.us forward slash give. Thank you for your generosity. Also, we would love to connect with you. So please follow, like, and subscribe to all of our social media platforms as well as downloading our app on both the Apple and Google Play stores. Be sure to turn on notifications so you never miss a thing. Thanks for watching and see you next time.